Thank you. <clears throat> so good afternoon or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you about the long history which led to the discovery of the Higgs boson at uh, the LHC. This history will concentrate mainly on ATLAS, but not only. So let me start with a few words about me. Well, I'm quite senior, 72 years old, and I'm Swiss. <clears throat> Let me say that I have been always fascinated with particle physics from when I started university, and then the real kick came when I was a summer student at CERN in the early 70s, and so I reminded from then on really uh, hooked on to particle physics. So I have worked at several uh, accelerators and colliders at CERN, essentially all of them. And on the lower part, you see two slides, how I looked like when I was uh, 50 years younger, essentially. I will come back to these experiments. Then I was uh, spending a few years as a research associate at uh, SLAC in the United States in the group of Bert Richter. And I got some experience in E plus E minus uh, physics. Back in Europe, I became a staff at CERN and was then fully involved in the proton-antiproton -proton collider uh, experiment, UI2. We will talk about that and also its upgrade. And on the lower left, you can uh, see me there in, in the red uh, white shirt, actually also enjoying putting my hands on, on detector. And I was always close to the detector of uh, anti-experiments. So then since the middle or early or middle 1980s, I was, uh, motivated very much to look forward for the high, for a high energy uh, Hadron Collider. We started discussing at that time already the, the LHC in the future uh, lab tunnel, which was not yet built at that time. So I will talk all about that in these uh, lectures. Now let me just maybe point out that uh, for me it was always also a great motivation for uh, helping uh, to build up experiments which are there for everybody, for all talents from everywhere. And I think a nice occasion to share actually the enthusiasm for these experiments is given, for example, by summer schools. And in fact, the physics school which uh, Ketevi has installed for the African continent, I think is a, is a great thing. And I, as you can see on the picture, I enjoyed being part of that. So let, let me now come to uh, the topics. I will give two lectures. The first part will be uh, illustration in a way of the history and illustration of uh, building the ATLAS experiment. There is a long history in collider uh, experiments at Hadron Colliders. One has not just learned from, made a step from zero to ATLAS or CMS, and I will show you this in the, in the following slides. And then in a week from now, I will switch to uh, some of the physics highlights, also uh, demonstrating what it actually means to arrive at uh, these physics highlights. But let me uh, just one, give one slide where I like sometimes to summarize the whole long history, the process of uh, the LHC with uh, two pictures, namely 
to say that this is really a global scientific adventure. It was initiated, as you will hear, more than 35 years ago. It combines accelerator, experiments, worldwide computing grid, and of course, the main motivation is from the physics, which comes from our theory colleagues. So it's really spanning over the full uh, community of particle physics. Let me just remind you a few basics from the standard model of particle physics, because that will be, uh, of course, the main theme. Uh, we see here on the left side, just to remind you, the three families of the matter particles, quarks and their corresponding leptons. And on the right side, we see the mediators, the particles that uh, are responsible for uh, the interaction of these elementary particles. And three of these forces, electromagnetic, strong, and weak force, they are uh, described by quantum field series. And um, of course, they are implying that uh, there should be uh, a possible excitation of these fields. And we should see actually effects, in some case, even the particle of uh, these uh, forces. So we have in the standard model, the matter particles, the mediators, and then we have the third element, very important is the broad Englert Hicks uh, mechanism, which describes actually uh, the interactions and which also is responsible for the fact that these uh, particles have masses. Well, on slide eight, you have a more, uh, more serious uh, table of uh, the elementary uh, particles in the standard model. Again, the fermions, the matter particles, with uh, spin one half, the bosons with uh, entire anti integral spin, and the very uh, famous unique scalar particle, the Higgs boson. We will talk about that in the future now. Let me also just uh, still mention that the particles which we actually collide in the Hadron Collider, the protons, or in previous colliders also the antiprotons, and all the matter are not uh, really the uh, fundamental particles, but are um, objects which are bound by the strong force. You see, for example, the, the proton or the antiproton with uh, U and uh, D quarks. This is all described by the quark model, which was uh, put forward in the 1964 by Delman and uh, George Zweig. So this is the last of my uh, kind of theory introductory slide, just for your reference. These are pictures in a way of all the, the pioneers of the standard model of physics with, for the quark model, as I said, Elman Zweig is a famous proud Engler Hicks, but also Guralnik, Hagen and Kibble for the breaking of the electroweak uh, interactions. And then for the gauge theory of the strong interaction uh, we have also David Gross, Politzer, and Wilcher. Very important is the little yellow box here because we should not forget that the strengths of the standard model, of course, was beautiful theory construct, but it's only valid because it has been established step by step by experiments. So let me then come now to Hadron Colliders. And Hadron Colliders play a very 
strong role in understanding of particle physics. This here is a is a an interesting uh, summary in a way what contributes to particle physics, namely the energy frontier with colliders, the intensity frontier, also with colliders, but also with much smaller high intensity machine. And then of course comes all the knowledge from the cosmic frontier. I can just say here that the LHC addresses in first place the energy frontier and also major part of the intensity frontier. But before talking about the LHC and the LHC Hadron uh, Collider experiments, I would like to step back a little bit and give you uh, some historical background. As I said at the very beginning, these colliders are based on what has been learned over a period of uh, something like uh, 50 years. So I will mention a bit the CERN intersecting storage ring, then the CERN SPS anti-proton collider and the Fermilab proton anti-proton collider. So first the uh, intersecting storage ring. This was really the first Hadron collider in the 19, uh, 70s. It had a circumference of about one kilometer and was fed by the proton synchrotron. It could reach energies up to 63 GV. So that was a uh, very uh, frontier machine and unfortunately in a way we made the wrong experiments there as I will tell you in the sense that uh, this is a picture of a typical experiment of the one which I was involved in, which only instrumented some uh, limited solid angles. So there was a lot of space where there were no, uh, no detectors available. By the way, you also see on this machine that the beams were really in two separate uh, rings. I go back one slide and you see here the orange and the green ring and they were really brought into collision at quite some uh, angle. Well, the comment which I already made, this is now a, a cross section of that experiment where I showed you a picture of, there is a lot of dead space and unfortunately this meant one did not always uh, have uh, the best efficiency to see new physics and the somewhat hard lecture we had to learn from the ISR is that we could have made uh, discoveries, for example discoveries like the JAPE side which was very nicely seen only, however it was a few years after its discovery at uh, SLAC and at Brookhaven. However, there was one particular thing which was found at the, uh, at the ISR, which one can say is really uh, a legacy result. Namely, people started looking at uh, what happens at 90 degrees from the beam line where the beam cross. And one has seen that there were much more large transverse momentum particle, pi zeros for example, they were measured with Leclerc counters, then what one would have uh, expected in simple uh, scattering models at that time, 1970s. So that was really kickoff of uh, of uh, high PT phenomena. And high PT phenomena are something which uh, governs the Hadron Collider experiment uh, today. So again, you see here a cross section of an experiment where only two arms were 
uh, instrument. But this allowed at least to see already that uh, there are much more IPT pions than what was expected. So towards the end, people became more clever and they said, well, we need to instrument really the full solid angle or a, a bit of the a solid angle. And indeed, that would have allowed uh, experiments to be much more efficient and, for example, to uh, see the two-jet structure, which was such a striking thing, well, discovered now at the next machine I will talk to you. Actually, what you see here, and you will see once more for uh, many times now in the following, is that one depicts the energy uh, deposition in the uh, in the well around the interaction point phi this is the azimuth angle around the beam lines and you see that separated by 180 degrees you have accumulation of energies so something uh, striking must have happened now as i said this was in 1983 and already before a much more clear signal of this uh, hard scattering of the uh, ingredients of the proton and uh, have been uh, seen in the CERN PIVA-P collider. So the next generation uh, machine I want to talk about and mention is the CERN SPS P by P collider. This is this ring here. It's a 6.7 kilometer ring, which um, we have a picture on the right bottom side. This was an accelerator for accelerating protons to 450 GV. And then there came the genius idea of Carlo Rubia and some collaborators that well, within this beam pipe, we could have protons going in one direction and the magnetic field would just be right to guide antiprotons in the other direction. So the only problem was to produce, of course, the antiprotons and there was a whole machinery, a whole pre-accelerator complex which was operated to produce the antiprotons, store them because you need many of them, and then uh, at some point inject in the opposite uh, direction in this SPS ring of 450 uh, GV. This was only possible to have enough antiprotons because of, uh, of a very great idea of a machine engineer. And I want to mention this, Simon van der Meer. He actually uh, made it possible that one had enough antiprotons accumulated such that one had enough proton-antiproton collisions then to find the W and the C, and I will show them. His trick was, was a nice one because uh, when you produce antiprotons, they have quite different energies, and this is uh, our momenta, this is the momentum spread of such uh, captured antiprotons. And in order to make really a, a dense bunch, you have to align them and give them the direct, uh, old, if possible, the same momentum to keep them in. Uh, the chain for injecting them against the protons in the SPS. And this was done by having a pickup which would measure the spread of the beam and making a little correction, taking a shortcut so you are faster than the antiproton going in the ring. And rightly so, he was certainly recognized as well when the Nobel Prize for the W and the C were given. So just to tell you, the uh, 
proton antiproton collider was operated from 1981 to 1990, and it delivered a lot of results, namely the unambiguous discovery of jets and hadron collisions, and then the W and C uh, discoveries, and uh, many other things which I will not talk about. Just to tell you that also with the anti-proton collider at CERN, one started to build in more complete experiments. And the first one pioneering this was really the UA1 experiment. That was the experiment of Carlo Rubio, which built a hermetic box around the interaction point. So the beams were colliding here. So that's how this uh, box looked like. It was already quite a substantial experiment. At that time, there was also a second experiment that I was working on, which was uh, called UA2. And we did not have the resources really to build a fully hermetic detector in the first place, but at least we built a central calorimeter with a large uh, granularity, what we called at that time large granularity of, of cells. Having learned that you actually need full coverage around the interaction point, there was a second phase to this experiment, uh, which was called UA2 prime. So this was the, sorry, was the result of the first run event in 1981. And it was very striking that now uh, the two jet structure, clear evidence that you have quark, 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 gluon, or gluon, gluon scattering, hard scattering within the proton and antiprotons was uh, seen here. This is, for example, the uh, energy distribution again. 180 degrees apart from each other in azimuth uh, in events where there was a lot of transverse energy of very hard scattering events. In fact, if you looked at the most hardest one, in fact, the fraction of the highest or the two highest jets, they made up for all of the energy. So that was a very clean discovery of the two jet structure. But of course, the main issue of the P bar P collider was the discovery of the W and the Z boson. And uh, these are <clears throat> have been done in the years 82, 83 by the UA1 and UA2 experiments. You see on the left a picture of all the tracks. And this here with the red is an electron recoiling against nothing essentially, because it was a neutrino from the UA1 experiment, or on the right hand picture, you see the electromagnetic energy very narrowly in the electromagnetic calorimeter of an electron and a positron in the UA2 experiment. And in fact, just to tell you in the beginning, in uh, 82, 83, there were an accumulation in UA1 of, well, four events at around 90 GV. We know now the Z boson has a, a mass of 92 GV or a couple of more events, again, very cleanly separated from the background in the UA2 experiment. Now, by the end of the uh, CERN P by P uh, period, one had not only a handful of events, but already something like, for example, 2000 W events. And from the shape of the transverse mass distribution, one could uh, measure the mass of the W. As you will see later in the next uh, lecture, actually in the standard model, the uh, W mass plus other input constrains the top mass. And this was a constraint given by UA2 that would, was predicting that the top mass will be 160 
well, plus 50 minus 60 GV, so not very precise. And to make really a machine, to find the top, one had to go uh, to the next, this leads naturally to the next generation experiments, namely the Tevatron, which uh, operated at uh, Fermilab in the United States. It operated from 87 in the first run until 2011 in the second run. And it had a spectacular increase in luminosity, integrated luminosity and also peak luminosity. This was really, I would say, the onset of very sophisticated experiments. You can see here on the left a picture of the CDF detector, a real collider experiment with uh, instrumentation all around in phi and also in the forward backward direction, similarly for the D0 experiment. What was also a very important step was that uh, the analysis methods became very sophisticated and with this also all the, the representation of the collisions. These are beautiful uh, event displays from CDF and D0 no more hand drawn like we did this in uh, the previous uh, experiments. Now, the very big, uh, big achievement, of course, of the uh, Tevatron was really in 1995, the discovery of the top core. In fact, TT bar events were produced. The, the top quark decays immediately into a W and a B. And the W, for example, can decay into leptonically an electron and a neutrino, or a muon and a neutrino, or the W can also decay in uh, two uh, quarks giving uh, jets. And in fact, on the next slide, you see some event displays. Let's look, for example, on the top. This is a D0 event where you have an electron, a muon, and also two jets actually in the event. And when they uh, fitted the mass, well, with a few events, very similarly as when we discovered the WRC, you see that there was a clear accumulation of events at around 170, 180 uh, GB. So that was the discovery. Uh, plots and of course at the end of the Tevatron much more clean signals for example from CDF here for the top quark uh, has been uh, found and have been fitted in order to extract then the mass of the top quark in this case 174 plus minus 65, uh, plus 0.65 uh, GB. This value is still uh, very good, actually as good as we have uh, now at uh, the uh, LHC. So let me skip the next slide and go immediately to slide 38 and start introducing the LHC. The LHC is the machine which is installed in the former lab tunnel, the 27 kilometer tunnel. And it has actually four main experiments, uh, which we will uh, discuss. I will discuss two of them, CMS and ATLAS, as we are talking here about uh, the Higgs discovery. But just as a intermezzo, let me say the LHC, the LHC was also a, uh, a girls band at CERN, which uh, was very popular in the 90s. And I show this because a picture of these four ladies making very nice music was actually the first picture which was on the web. And I just want to remind you that in the 90s, 
early 90s, actually the uh, World Wide Web was um, developed at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee and collaborators and very recently last year Fabiola Gianotti and uh, Tim were celebrating 30 years of the web. Can you imagine we could live without the web now? Okay, so how came the LHC? Well, <clears throat> in fact, there was already in the, in the late 70s uh, when the LEP tunnel, this 27 kilometer uh, tunnel for a E plus E minus collider was discussed. One said one should make it large enough that it could house eventually in the far future also a Hadron Collider. This is uh, Professor Tsikiki who led this uh, study. But, but then it was really only in the early 1980s when UA1 and UA2 were so successful finding the W and the C that people uh, believed that the Hadron Collider can actually make discovery of physics and uh, so it really started in 1984 that uh, many of us thought we should push for a future uh, Hadron Collider in this uh, lab tunnel. And the one which was pushing most strongly, of course, was uh, Carlo Rubia. He deserves a lot of credit that um, the LHC came into life. Just to tell you, of course, at that time, we had no idea where the mass of the Higgs boson would be. And this is a, a, a simulation from that time when we tried to convince us and other people, of course, that, for example, we could very well see a Higgs boson of 400 GV above uh, the background. We were also extremely optimistic at that time about the time scale. So this is from a slide from, from uh, the early, well, from 87, around when we thought we could start running the LHC in 1998. But as you know, it took 10 years more to build than the experiment. So let me go a bit fast about this history. So then <clears throat> Rubia convinced the CERN uh, member states that the LHC would be the next good project to build. Of course, we could not build it alone, so one had to find uh, people from uh, also non-CERN member states. And the project was really brought to a decision to the council in 94 by the then uh, Director General Chris Lemming Smith. It was first uh, proposed in two stages, but it was understood that if we would find enough resources, one could build it immediately in a single stage for a 14 TV collider. And so the machine which we know now was approved in 1996 by the CERN Council after uh, many uh, partners were found like Japan, Russia, India, Canada, and the US. So just briefly to say, an accelerator, a collider, really consists of several basic elements, namely dipole magnets, of course, to have the beams going around, of quadrupole magnets to focalize the beam, of an RF cavities to accelerate the beam, and of uh, collimators to have a clean environment for the beam, and also of dump and extraction line. So just to show you some of these elements, how they look like, these are the dipole magnets. This is the single most important element of the machine. The beams are counter-rotating here in the beam pipes. They are typically uh, 25 centimeters apart. 
uh, in the arcs and uh, the field of the uh, in these dipole magnets is arranged such that well uh, here the protons go in that direction and are bent for example towards us and here the uh, protons on the other beam go in the other direction so the field lines can be uh, made in this way. This is very important because the forces between these uh, coils are uh, tremendous. So these magnets were developed and built over many many years and then they had to be installed uh, in the ring of 27 kilometers they were lowered at one place they were about 15 meters long and uh, transported well 13 and a half kilometers in the longest way so it was a long long process to install them i mentioned the uh, accelerating cavities they are located at one place on the ring uh, which give a kick to the protons to accelerate them and to keep them at the uh, colliding uh, energy of, of the beams. So they are supraconducting uh, cavities. Uh, then finally in front of the experiments, because collisions are so rare, one needed to make the highest dense collision uh, possible to get the most collisions. So they are uh, supraconducting uh, quadrupoles and I mentioned them because they were uh, typical contributions from non-CERN member states. For example, these uh, quadrupoles were built jointly by Japan, KK and by Fermilab. So the whole installation of the machine, building the magnets and so on, took about uh, eight years. So this here is a scale from January uh, 201 to uh, January 208. Now, not only, uh, of course, are there needed a lot of uh, magnets for the uh, LHC itself, but there is a whole chain which was needed to optimize to produce a lot of particles. In fact, just to give you a um, idea about the number of collisions you need to produce in order to have one, for example, uh, detectable Higgs boson is about one in 10 to the 13. So you need really a lot of uh, intensity in the beams. I cannot talk about that, time was too short, but you have here on this slide uh, some indications, how many bunches there go around, how many particles are in a bunch, and uh, in order to reach luminosity such that then these rare events can be found. However, Notice already immediately that, of course, uh, in order to find these very rare events, you need also highly sophisticated uh, instruments to select and then measure the, the events. Now, of that, <clears throat> I know that uh, <clears throat> Mario Campanoli has talked about uh, this quite a bit in his uh, first lecture. Now, for the experiments, just again, only for fun, we don't need to understand this now, but to tell you, we were thinking about how to make experiments. Of course, it would have been easy to make an experiment which has essentially just an iron absorber and only looks what comes out, namely the muons. With that, we could maybe have found the Higgs uh, particle, but not much more. So we were arguing that of course you need much more sophisticated experiments. I show this also because at that time the uh, presentations were still made uh, handwritten. So this was, uh, of course also this technology has evolved tremendously. So experimental 
ideas were then presented in 92. Notice that this was before the project was really fully formally approved. And then at the end, actually, uh, two experiments for the general purpose detectors were, uh, were selected. You can see here four general purpose experiment. And uh, it was clear there would not be resources for four. And uh, so one tried, if possible, to combine efforts. Uh, this worked out in the case of Atlas, of Ascot and Eagle, which became uh, Atlas. And we were then submitting really the experimental proposal, the first letter of intent in uh, 92. So that was the birth of Atlas. Um, I just can mention that then uh, the other experiment which made it was uh, CMS. I will just shortly show you a bit about that. There are two other very big experiments smaller than Atlas and CMS, but very big and very significant experiments on the LHC, which I will not talk about. One is LHCB to look at uh, heavy flavor physics, B physics, essentially, as its name says. And Alice, Alice is a very interesting uh, part of the LHC because the LHC can also collide not only protons, but it can also collide nuclei, for example, lead nuclei, and one can study the quark gluon plasma, uh, very relevant physics for understanding the strong interaction. Again, I will not talk about that in the limited time I have. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, two uh, large experiment, Atlas and CMS. And of course, CERN somehow favored the two uh, complementary experiments for people, not two times CMS or two times Atlas. So one would have uh, different systematic uh, errors, for example, in the results, or also uh, as technologies had to be developed, one uh, was interesting to, to have uh, two different uh, detectors. And they are really very different in terms of the magnetic field configuration. Then also quite different in terms of the electromagnetic calorimeter Atlas using liquid argon uh, calorimeter. I will show more about that. Uh, CMS crystals. And also the muon system was uh, quite different. Just to say, I can pick out one uh, complementary features, which is the magnetic field configuration, because that actually, when you design an experiment, uh, has a very, very big influence of uh, how the experiment looks like. CMS has gone for a very uh, strong solenoid. So the current is shown here in red, for example, going this way. And then the field lines in blue shows the magnetic field. Whereas Atlas has taken a very uh, different approach a more complicated one in a certain sense because it has combined a small solenoid in the inner part with a toroid system which consists of eight coils. Each coil has here in red again, you see them in the current as it goes, and then the magnetic field goes around, around the axis of the beam, and hence the name uh, toroid. Okay, let me show you a few pictures of uh, the actual uh, detector. This is a picture of uh, CMS, where we have here this four or 3.8 Tesla solenoid. 
with uh, inside tracking detectors and then the crystal calorimeter shown here in, in green and the part of the hadronic calorimeter. And then because this is such a huge magnetic field, it needs a strong heavy return yoke for, uh, to, to bend back the magnetic field. Uh, this is shown here in red, and then this is also instrumented by muon chambers. Uh, this is a cross-section through the CMS detector. You see it here now uh, from, you look along the beam and uh, you see a sector. So again, tracking detectors, electromagnetic calorimeter, hydronic calorimeter, and then this very thick magnetic uh, solenoid, a supraconducting solenoid, and the muon detector. And of course, you need all these detectors in order to uh, measure and define, identify the different particles. Uh, this is a picture of in the middle of 2006, 2005, when the magnetosolenoid was constructed, uh, assembled on the surface. And in fact, uh, this was then lowered down, as I will show in the next slide. The other very special component of the CMS detector are something like 80,000 uh, lead tungstenate crystals to measure with high precision, high energy resolution, the electromagnetic showers. And as I said, the experiment <clears throat> was actually uh, Reassembled on the surface and then with a very special crane, you see it pictured here, pieces, slices were lowered down into the, the cabin. And that's a nice picture in 208 when the CMS experiment was uh, built. And we see here the beam pipe. This is the, the cylinder. You see nicely the different detector layers and these are the end caps which at the end for operation of course will be closed. Very differently ATLAS. ATLAS is, uh, we see here a, a schematic of it with uh, the toroid coils, there are eight of them. Then we see in red and green the hadronic and the electromagnetic calorimeter, well, almost not visible, the solenoid, which just is around the inner uh, tracking detector. Just to give you some numbers, the length of this, it's the biggest experiment, the length of this is about 46 meters, and the diameter is about 25 meters. It weighs about 7,000 tons. So it doesn't have so much iron. I forgot to say, this detector here weighs about uh, 12,000 tons. Just to give you, a, give you the scale, Atlas is about the weight of one Eiffel Tower. CMS is the weight of two Eiffel Towers. It has been built, Atlas, by a world-spanning collaboration something like 3,000 scientists, 1,000 students. Uh, you can see here the numbers. And this is very similar for uh, CMS. I can maybe mention here that in this effort, actually from the African continent, uh, Morocco was part of it since the mid 1990s and uh, since the mid 2000 uh, South Africa is also part. And of course, we welcome uh, new collaborators also from uh, all the continents and in particular the African continent. So I want to be very quick on the, the history also, <clears throat> how these experiments were approved. It was a long, a long time. Remember, I said 92, we made the letter of intent for ATLAS. 
took three, four years to convince uh, CERN and the referee committees that uh, Atlas can be built. Same for CMS. And then it took yet another two years to get it formally really approved and to get also the commitment from all the funding agencies to get uh, it financed. There were many technical design reports which were written. Uh, just to give you an idea, the cost of uh, Atlas and similarly for CMS was of the order of uh, 500 million Swiss francs. So Atlas was then uh, planned to be installed in a cavern which still had to be built, a cavern which was very big, a length of 55 meters and uh, typically 35 meters in a diameter. It was important that, uh, that in fact, we were really approved finally in 97, because at that point, then one could also get the go ahead for starting the excavation. And it took something like five years to excavate this uh, huge cavern. This is a picture in 2003 when it was uh, still empty and almost ready for uh, giving uh, well, the space to the Atlas experiment. Now, <clears throat> of course, during that time, one also had to build uh, detectors and the biggest part is really the toroid system. Here you see once more a schematic view of the toroid system with in uh, light blue, the eight toroid coils. There are also two end cap toroids. Some, for those interested, there are some uh, numbers given. For example, the superconducting cable, which is needed if one takes <clears throat> barrel and end cap together, is about 80 kilometers or so. And uh, just to show you, these were really huge uh, coils, which were built in industry, parts of it, and then they were assembled at, in a very big assembly hall at CERN. They were also tested because the current in these coils is something like 20 kiloamps. So they were tested on the surface to 22 kiloamps. You want to be sure that they're working. And once when the test was done, then they were transported to the experimental uh, area, point one, you see quite, quite a big thing. And uh, let me show you that then in the years 2004, 2005, uh, it was installed in this experimental cavern. And that was a huge uh, work, you see it building up. Just to say, this took one year to construct uh, this uh, detective. Now here you see very nicely the eight coils of the parallel part. And you see now why it's called a toroid because the magnetic field goes for the muon system goes around like that. The solenoid is in here and I will show you just uh, next. This was installed together with the calorimeter you have here a, a schematic of the calorimeter, which has in the brown inner part uh, liquid argon. Liquid argon means cryogenics. So this is about 80 degrees Kelvin. Uh, it was developed in what we call the accordion geometry. And then around we have a scintillated tile calorimeter. Here is a picture of uh, the, this liquid argon uh, accordion calorimeter. And also again showing you that in the 90s, we were making small prototypes. This was just a tabletop uh, calorimeter prototype. And I want to mention this because the Director General of CERN now, Fabiola Cianotti, she was actually working on this little uh, prototype uh, 
together with Daniel Fournier and many others and myself. And she was soldering resistors and things like that. So, okay, you, you can see you have, uh, when you do good work on developing detectors, you have also all the opportunities for making a important career in, in science. Now the real modules, there were 64 like that, have been built in several labs, in particular also in France. And uh, then they were put into the cryostat. This was work going on between 99 and 204. And uh, also at that time, then the solenoid was built in Japan, was shipped to CERN and put together with the liquid argon here into the uh, common cryostat. Maybe a picture from the uh, hadronic calorimeter, which is uh, scintillated tiles and iron, very fine grained. This was also specially developed for the LHC and we see that, for example, there were 64 such wedges built and uh, there were the mechanical part was built, for example, here in Dubna and then uh, brought by truck uh, to Sir. And in 204, the first ones fully equipped were lowered into, uh, into the cabin. And of course, then the rest was built up uh, later on. This finally is a picture in 207 when you see again all the, uh, the coils here. Already the end cap calorimeters. Again, liquid iron going with the cryostats and, uh, and tile calorimeters. For example, some of uh, one of these liquid iron calorimeters in the end caps were built in Marseille, for example, and, and then uh, tested, brought to CERN, put in the cryostats. You also see here already the muon chambers instrumenting the uh, toroid. Finally, uh, let me say a word about the inner detector, the tracking detector. It has about uh, 100 million uh, channels. In Atlas, it consists of uh, pixels in the innermost part, then of uh, silicon strips in, uh, the, in the immediate range, and then of a transition radiation detector, which helps us to distinguish uh, also between electrons and uh, pions. So some pictures of, uh, this is a very high tech uh, detector. You see here, uh, for example, one of half cylinder being built of uh, the <clears throat> pixel detector. And uh, of course, being the most delicate part, this detector <clears throat> was in inserted just uh, when the big pieces were already all in place. Finally, I mentioned already <clears throat> the muon chambers. They were, again, this was a, a huge enterprise with many, many uh, universities, sites on three continents, in Asia, in uh, Europe, and in the United States, which uh, built different type of chambers and then they were installed. So there are hundreds of such uh, modules which were installed. And finally, to complete this, I want to, to mention that <clears throat> one should, something one doesn't like to talk too much about it, but uh, you need, of course, to get out the signal cables. You need to get in the uh, power for the electronics. You need also a lot of liquids, cooling electronics, but also, of course, the cryogenics for the liquid argon calorimeter or for the supraconducting uh, toroid system. So this gives you an idea. More than 50,000 cables and pipes had to be installed. And that was another work 
which uh, took about uh, three years, of course, going in parallel with the installation of the detector. So finally, uh, there was a historical moment, really, on the 16th June 2008, when the last piece of the beam pipe was put. On the left side, this is the cylinder of the Atlas barrel detector. And uh, you see also the end cap toroid already inserted, but it's not yet closed because some of the muon detectors in the forward direction are really still recessed. The beam pipe is being mounted and then this will be closed uh, completely. So let me stop maybe, this is indeed just one hour, to say that <clears throat> of course we have many famous uh, visitors in particular also some of the heroes I mentioned of uh, the standard model. For example, uh, Francois Englert, Peter Hicks, Steven Weinberg, visiting the experiments. And I can tell you they were all always very, very impressed what uh, the experimenters have uh, put on the way in order to verify uh, their, their thoughts, their theories. And uh, as we will see in the next lecture, they had all very good reasons to be, to be happy. It took only, uh, only a few years after 2008 that indeed uh, the Higgs boson was, was found. So, in the next lecture, this will be quite different. I will tell you about uh, something about first uh, looking at the, no, I don't have it here, at the um, commissioning of the experiment, making sure that it actually does what it should, at verifying this first with cosmic rays and then with the first collisions, re-establishing all the known particles from the standard model and finally finding the uh, Higgs particle. So I stop here for today. Hi, Peter. Um, thanks very much uh, for this uh, great uh, historical perspective. Um, we're going to uh, have a discussion session with some questions. I'm looking forward um, to that. Yeah, so there were some questions on the chat before. Uh, Kola, you want to ask your question? Oh yeah, uh, it's, uh, thank you for the for the wonderful lecture. Man. You're uh, welcome. It's, yeah, just, it's just a quick question that I had at the near the beginning of the lecture, where you were talking about dead spaces between the beam lines. And I just wanted to find out why why the dead spaces decrease the efficiency between. The ah, you know, you only. Uh, detect particles, of course, where you have detectors. So um, if, for example, you want to look at the decay of, let's, let's take the shape side particle, which, which we could have discovered at the ISR, but we did not, because <clears throat> the shape side, it uh, decays sometimes in the E plus and E minus. Now, of course, if you don't have everywhere detectors, very often you miss it. You miss one or even both of, uh, of these decay particles. So that, that's very bad. <clears throat> so clearly you, you need to um, take much more data to have the probability that you actually catch both of them. So that's one aspect, but there's much worse than that. 
because, for example, to look at the W decay, the W can be discovered or was discovered by its decay into an electron and a neutrino or a muon and a neutrino. Now, how can you be sure that you would have, you have a, a neutrino in your uh, detector when you have uh, just big gaps where there is no detection element? So, in fact, <clears throat> the neutrinos, they do not interact in these collider experiments. You can only see them, see them, in quotation mark, by uh, indirectly, by, by seeing that something is missing, namely some transverse momentum, transverse energy is missing. And of course, you can only be sure that uh, you would have seen all the transverse energy when you have all around the beam pipe uh, detectors. Otherwise, you never know if there was something, but it just went into, into your gap where you have nothing. So this, and this is very important, not only, of course, for the neutrinos, for the Ws, but this is also important. We will see that uh, in the next lecture because one of the prime signatures for supersymmetry or physics beyond the standard model would be that there is a uh, lightest neutral uh, supersymmetric particle which escapes the detector. And so uh, you clearly need to be able to have uh, confidence that you measure all the visible transverse energy as good as possible. So that if something is not visible, it's not because you have a problem with your detector or a hole in your detector, but that you know it was a particle which did not interact in the detector. Oh, so, 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 having, so, so covering the whole solid angle is mainly, because, is mainly to detect missing transverse and uh, transverse moments. Missing transverse energy, but also for having a complete picture of the events. And as I said, for <clears throat> in the simple case, for example, of uh, Jay Psi or, uh, or uh, Z decaying in two particles that, that you see uh, that you have a higher uh, efficiency, higher acceptance. Okay. So, so this is mandatory, just to say, it is really in uh, modern collider experiments, it's mandatory to have uh, full coverage of the solid angle. So I, it's, it's, it's a bit of a parallel to what you to what you just said. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but then the Alice experiment doesn't cover the whole solid angle, right? Yes, that's it, correct. And and uh, but because there, it's a very it's a different type of physics. The Alice experiment is not, uh, for example, looking primarily <clears throat> at uh, is high efficiency at, uh, at Ws or, or Cs. Still, you can see some of them, but uh, it's a very different philosophy. For example, in the Alice experiment, uh, there are many specific detectors which allow one to uh, identify the identity of the particles. Uh, it's, so it's, it's not the same, same philosophy. You also can do that because uh, for this physics, you need less uh, collisions. So it's, 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 it's really different. You're right. The Alice and the LHCB detected, they do not cover the full uh, solid angle. Okay, and I wanted to find out also um, how does how does the 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 the, the, the two different uh, ma um, magnet arrangements for CMS 
and the atlas experiments affect the trajectory of your um your 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 collision your your collision um 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 particles that, that come from your yeah, collision so for the cms if i manage to go that fast I should come. Sorry, I'm too far. No. For CMS, I can show it here. So, CMS, <clears throat> the blue, the, the, the light blue line is a muon, which is uh, deflected. In the inner part, this is the solenoid, so it's a solenoidal field, it uh, is deflected like that. And this is the same in, in Atlas for the inner part as well. Then in the return yoke, because the field gets, is in the different direction, which you can see it here and here, uh, the deflection is opposite to it. Now in Atlas, this is very different. So you have the, uh, yeah, I can go back also. In Atlas, the solenoid part inside is the same as in CMS, but then uh, outside, as the field is orthogonal to the one in the solenoid, uh, the deflection is also orthogonal. So the, the particles outside are deflected away or towards the, the beam line, depending on their charge. So there, in a way, the, it was one of the de design criteria in Atlas that one wanted to have actually two independent measurements of uh, the muon momentum because the deflections are orthogonal to each other. Whereas uh, here they are, of course, in the, same, in the same plane. They are completely correlated to two deflections. Okay. So that, that's maybe uh, referring to your question. Okay. And then uh, last question. Um, <clears throat> it's just, it's just a, a, a naive question, I think. There's this table where you're co comparing uh, CMS, um, the CMS experiments and the ATLAS experiments. And then one of the cri criteria you said, yeah. Um, you said the CMS, uh, CMS tracker doesn't have uh, particle identification. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Indeed, there was a lot of uh, discussion about that. So because of uh, the transition radiation tracker, uh, as I said, this gives an additional handle for electron uh, detection. So this we thought is an interesting feature to have in the Atlas experiment. However, <clears throat> uh, clearly this goes, uh, it's always a bit of a compromise because then the inner detector in uh, Atlas has a less good uh, resolution, momentum resolution. If you only take the track, you see this very clearly on this line because with the TRT, uh, the Resolution is not as good as if you have all in uh, silicon strips, pixel strips. So uh, you see, all all these um, designs of the experiment in in a certain way is a bit of a is a compromise. You you cannot possibly have everywhere uh, the best possible uh, performance because sometimes. These are <clears throat> will be ex well exclude each other, uh, and then uh, there is of course another another big constraint, which is the money and the space you have, and so. On. Okay.
Thank you so much. Okay. But yes, this was this was uh, this was an interesting discussion. With actually, this table was an interesting discussion. The whole table, in a way, <clears throat> with the uh, review committees, which, as I said, it took them three years, or it took us three years to convince them that Atlas is a good experiment and uh, CMS is also a good experiment. And in fact, uh, even so, they have uh, put emphasis a little bit on, on different things. So you can see this also, for example, uh, in the electromagnetic calorimeter. If you would be only interested in purely the energy resolution, the crystals are giving you a better resolution. However, uh, that's not the end of the story because you also need to identify the electrons or the photons uh, very well. So if you have longitudinal segmentation, uh, this helps you a lot. And, and again, you will see, I will show you the, the uh, well, the performance at the end. Uh, at the end, I think both experiments, first of all, did work quite nicely and also with very uh, similar performances. Even so, uh, the approach was, was quite different. Does the fact that um, uh, the, 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 mag the mag magnetic field, it, it, does the fact that the, the ATLAS experiment has a, a smaller magnetic field mean that it's a, a bit more energy efficient than the CMS? Uh, well, that's, the stored energy is somewhat smaller than, than CMS, but uh, it's not so, so small. And just remind, I want to remind you that the field inside is uh, smaller indeed, but then of course there is a quite a strong toroid field. And uh, so it's, one cannot compare directly, but in terms of uh, uh, stored energy, indeed uh, CMS is a little bit more stored energy than, uh, than Atlas. I, can uh, show you, I did not put this slide, sometimes when I have more, more uh, time I will put this, but I can show you the stored energy just to give you a, an idea. Ah, sorry, it will be, it will be here. Uh, Atlas has about one and a half uh, gigajoule, uh, CMS has about two and a half or so. So it's one, 1.1 gigajoule in the uh, in the toroid of the barrel, and then two times half a gigajoule in uh, the end caps. So this is so they but as they are superconducting magnets, they are actually quite uh, energy uh, quite good in terms of energy uh, consumption compared, for example, to the Alice magnet, which is a warm magnet. Uh, this was the former L3 magnet, which, which, is, uh, which burns a lot of energy. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I can add that, of course, in the energy balance, you, you also have to put in then uh, the refrigeration and so on. It's, it's not only purely the magnet, uh, the magnet, the stored energy in the magnet which, which counts, but it's also you have to refrigerate this to superconducting uh, temperature and all this. Is, this. is this the cryostats that you're referring to? Yes. So okay. here, these, these are separate cryostats for the eight coil. <clears throat> plus the cryostats for the uh, two end caps. And then also there's a cryostat, as I said, for the solenoid and the liquid argon calorie. Whereas in the CMS case, of course, it's a, it's a very substantial cryostat because of the, the very high field and very high current also. So CMS still uses much more energy than Atlas. <laughs> I wouldn't say much more, but 
someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions, please. I uh, Peter, I, I have one question. So I remember that um, around 2001, when I was at CERN, there were a lot of discussion and tension about uh, stopping the LEP accelerator and, and, and starting the LHC. At that time, there was uh, the, the, the LEP uh, experiment. Uh, results suggest that uh, the Higgs will be will just be below or very close to uh, to the limit uh, the energy limits that uh, that left can offer and a lot of people were were upset that uh, the left was being terminated and so to run longer and see whether they could have discovered the Higgs so in the light of, uh, I think there was a hard decision taken by Miami at the time, if I remember correctly, as the director general of CERN. Um, um, so in the light of what had happened, um, so what do you think of, of that historical part? Was it a good decision taken by CERN at the time to stop LEP when they did? Yes, I, 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 well, I definitely think so. And we will, we will see this also actually then in the second lecture because <clears throat> the lab could achieve, well, the lab was, could achieve Higgs masses up to about 115 GV and with very, very, uh, very, very marginal uh, significance, even if there would have been a Higgs at 150. Whereas uh, we know now, of course, the Higgs is at 125 GV, so there's no way to, to, uh, to reach uh, this with this lab. But yeah, it was a very tense uh, period, and I think the Director General Mayani and the, also the um, chairperson of the LEP committee, which was uh, Michel Spiro, I think they did the right decision. And I remember that I made a lot of enemies when, when in an open meeting, I argued, of course, that uh, the, the hints from LEP were so marginal that everybody could see that, that you would have to, to run for years, even if it would have been true that it is uh, 115 GV. And uh, one has also to understand that it would have cost CERN a lot of money because uh, all the civil engineer constructors and so were all ready to start uh, making civil engineering works and uh, if you delay them of course you nevertheless you would have had to pay part of it and pay big penalties so uh, yes I think in, in retrospect uh, I think nobody argues anymore that uh, it was not the right decision but it was of course emotionally a very uh, difficult decision and, and the you needed the courage of uh, of the CERN management to to take this decision, but yes, I definitely think it was the, the correct one, as we know. But let me also say again, this could be a discussion in the next lecture. Of course, I was a bit <clears throat> nervous uh, if if the Higgs would have been found by you, Ketevi, and others at uh, 118 uh, GV or something like that, uh, I guess people would have been unhappy. I was rather relieved that it was 125, which was out of question for them. Yeah. So, okay. There are two hands raised. Arnold, are you still there? You want to talk?
Uh, Yasin, you have a question? Yes, please. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the nice talk. It's really nice to have uh, the founder of Atlas Experiment here. So uh, on slide 15, if you look at the left plot, we see two peaks. What is uh, the physical meaning for the second peak? Excuse me, I did not catch the question exactly. Uh, on slide 15. 15? Yes. Ooh, okay, I will, I will go back. Yeah. So here, here on the left plot, we see two peaks, right? 15 on, and oh, on the right. I am almost there. 15. Uh, what, yeah. what this on one? Right, yeah, on the right plot. Ah, okay, okay. Well, <clears throat> you know, there is the shape sign, yeah. and then there is the side prime. There's a, there's a particle there, uh, which, of course, has been seen very nicely in E plus E minus also. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a side prime particle. But, okay. yeah, I showed this plot just to say that, uh, well, Okay, if we would have had this experiment two or three years earlier, we could have found the, the chip side. And, and it's not only this, I mean, there, there were uh, the, the uh, ISI was, okay, it was the first Hadron Collider and uh, one had to learn. But also the Upsilon particle at uh, nine, nine and a half GB. It's also a family of three upsilons, actually. They could have found, could have been found at the ISR. If, uh, so the J size and, and the, the upsilon family, both could have been found at the ISR if one would have had a uh, well, next generation experiment. Oh, but afterwards, it's always easy to say. Oh, thanks. Uh, also on slide where uh, you show the reconstructed mass of top quark. So here. Which one? Uh, 34. 34. Yeah. 34? Yes. This one? So here, yes. So here, uh, slide after you show the reconstructed mass of the top quark. Yeah. Yes, so here, yeah. yeah, I assume we cannot reconstruct the top quark mass from the leptonically decaying of W boson. So here, uh, I assume this is the hadronically decaying, right? Well, <clears throat> you can see it here that in all these, uh, in these cases, you have neutrinos in the game. So, um, of course, you cannot fully uh, reconstruct the chain back. You first of all also, in the B case, it's uh, decaying into uh, typically hadronizing very often also, including uh, leptons sometimes. And you don't measure very well the, with high precision the, the, the masses. But the main reason really is that uh, you have in the W decay, in this particular case, you have uh, the uh, neutrinos in the game. So you see it also here. You, do not have ah, yes. this is Now, of course, in this uh, discovery <clears throat> plots, uh, well, in fact, at that time, uh, D0 even had a less uh, good uh, resolution, in particular for leptons. They have later on then uh, added a uh, solenoid. So in this case, they had to already assume that there is, well, that they, they had the handle on the background. 
and uh, what is the background is this dashed line and uh, what they expected as a mass resolution for the top was uh, this uh, pointed line. But it's clearly they saw an effect. It was a bit uh, less background in the case of uh, the D0 experiment. The D0 experiment had also less background because they were already at that time very early able to actually see displaced vertices. If I go back again here, you see that uh, the B decays typically after, uh, it's, it's not shown here, but the B has a finite lifetime which is detectable with a vertex detector. And so if you have uh, included in your signature, as they did here, you know, as for example, an event display. This is just around the beam pipe, around the interaction point. They saw two secondary vertices. And so uh, there is less background. And that's why there is less background in their discovery peak. This both experiments after the upgrades and so on were, were performing much, much cleaner and much better, as you can see for example, here on this CDF plot. Thank you. So this is something one has certainly learned. When we uh, started with the LHC in the late 80s and early 90s, very early 90s, people uh, did not yet include uh, the ability to see uh, secondary vertices. Actually, people were thinking you are crazy to want to do this at the Hadron Collider, and it was only thanks to what one has learned in a way by uh, CDF, and then CDF and D0, that one has uh, there to build vertex detectors, and they are very important. We do a lot of uh, B physics now. I just want to show you here. Uh, once more, this thing here, actually at that time, it was in the mid 80s, you can see uh, nowhere says it we should see these or so, only, uh, this only came later. We were not, uh, not even dreaming at that time that we would see uh, secondary vertices. So this, in, in a way, this, this uh, Handwritten transparency was pre, was before the time one knew that also at the Hadron Collider one could see uh, secondary vertices. Um, other questions? Uh, Sumia, uh, you have yes, a question? Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Thanks a lot, first of all, for the wonderful presentation, sir. You're welcome. My, my question is a bit naive, maybe, but uh, I wanted to inquire what advantages we gained by choosing a proton-proton collider uh, in place of an anti-proton and proton collider as was present before. The differences. Well, yes. yeah. So, of course, the... The anti-proton proton collider, that was a, a genius idea to reuse an accelerator which, which normally accelerates just protons and then hits them on a fixed target. And uh, <clears throat> the problem, of course, is that that's the whole, uh, was the whole uh, limitation in a way of a proton anti proton collider is that you need to produce anti protons. So, this typically happened with uh, the machines I saw with special uh, machines. You, you have a proton beam, let's say typically 20 GV from the PS at CERN or a bit higher energy at at uh, the Tevatron, what the, the way they did at Fermila. And then you have to accumulate the anti-protons. You have to 
bring them into a, a beam which has a little possible, lit, as little as possible uh, momentum spread, where this uh, stochastic cooling of Simon van der Meer was doing the trick. But doing all this, nevertheless, you never had <clears throat> the same amount of collisions as you can produce if you have in a way, two rings uh, with protons. And, uh, so you get much higher intensities. And indeed, we get uh, orders of many orders of magnitude, two or two, three orders of magnitude, higher uh, luminosity, as we call it, with a proton proton collider. And so, of course, we can produce uh, much. Uh, more rare events and the Higgs is a rare event and uh, we can produce also as you will see we produce in really hundreds of millions of W's and C's and uh, the same for the top these are real top factories as one can say the LHC so uh, but of course the machine is uh, you, you need to have two rings in the LHC, the two rings are, as I showed, uh, cleverly embedded in the same magnetic uh, structure, about 25 centimeters apart. Uh, in the first attempt to have two rings, which was the ISR, one really had two separate rings, which you could see. But, uh, it's, by the way, interesting that uh, there were machines uh, foreseen with would have two separate rings, I mean, visibly separate rings, not just uh, them hitting into the same magnetic structure. So it was, an, of course, it's much cheaper to have it, uh, these two in one magnet, as they are called. And that was also uh, an important breakthrough which made uh, the LHC affordable. Uh, Chilufia? So, uh, I just had one follow up. If that's possible. Yeah. Uh, so, I, uh, so, in terms of the physical processes that we are searching for, uh, there wouldn't have been any different if we were to achieve the same energy and luminosity with a proton anti proton collider as we are looking for in the proton proton collider. If, if one would uh, have a, a very intense source of antiprotons, uh, that is essentially true. Yes, there would be no basic difference. In fact, some of the things would even be, be more interesting and better. But uh, just to, to, to tell you one thing, uh, for those who are interested, for example, in, in uh, heavy ion collisions or so, you. Of course, this option you wouldn't have, you couldn't use it so easily as a, as a lead lead collider because you would have to, to have anti lead nuclei, and that I think would, would be a very difficult thing to, to produce. So, uh, the two rings give you also this possibility, and, and in fact, as I said, I will not, I will not talk about heavy ion collisions, but just to say, one also exploits the fact that one has two separate rings by the fact that one also has very interesting, uh, the very interesting possibility of colliding protons with lead nuclei. This is some uh, part which is uh, exploited also in the LHC and exploited by, by Alice, but also the other experiments. This you could not do if you would have uh, only one, one ring. Okay. Thank you, sir. Shalufia, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Peter. Hi, Ketevi. Thanks for the very nice talk. I have a non-physics question, and it's related to slide 71, where you show the map of the um, participants around the world uh, in the ATLAS collaboration. And my question is, given your 
legendary experience uh, on the Atlas exper uh, experiment and involvement with talking to different people around the world about Atlas. In your opinion, why do you think uh, there's very little uh, involvement from African countries uh, on Atlas? I'm guessing it's uh, pretty much the same across all experiments. And yeah. what would you be your advice to make it better? Uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> Shilifia. That, um, actually, we are welcoming very much, uh, we would welcome very much uh, a stronger uh, collaboration with uh, African, uh, with the African community, and I'm certainly very enthusiastic and, and uh, motivated to help this building up. I think one clear reason is that, of course, the infrastructures which exist in Africa are still uh, developing. They are not, of course, not as far advanced as uh, they are available in um, in the more privileged countries, like for example, in Europe. So uh, the number of um, of uh, physicists which have see a future in going into basic research like particle physics is of course much smaller than in, in Europe, but how can we, we have to work on that. We have just to, to uh, step by step, I think, uh, building up uh, infrastructures and, and in particular also convince, of course, uh, governments that the educational value of uh, participating in fundamental science is uh, very large. Of course, not every, you know, all the, I said there are about thousand students, PhD students on Atlas, they are not all becoming particle, they are becoming particle physicists for their thesis, but then in life, they do very different thing, which uh, enrich, of course, the welfare of, of society and this is the argument we have to, uh, of course, bring to, to the politician. So um, I think it's, as you have, of course, seen it, it takes, uh, it takes time to, to uh, build this up. And uh, I think exactly the, African School of Physics, for example, is a, is a formidable uh, thing to that. I think also all the, the efforts to, to um, involve uh, teachers, high school teachers or so, to motivate uh, our young uh, colleagues to go into uh, science studies. This is very important. So, I think there's not a simple answer to, to your question, but there is a big agenda in front of us, in front of you, to, to, uh, to work on that. Of course, it's not, uh, I would like very much that this map would not look as white as it does now. And Katevi uh, knows that uh, I will be very happy if this will be different. And, and I keep optimism that it will change. But we need a young generation. We need you, you guys to, to work on that as well. Sure, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, so I think this has been quite lively. Um, and uh, we're gonna have uh, Peter again next week to continue the discussion. So I suggest that for today we can stop now and then we come back next week.
Uh, hi, Kitev, this is Hasna. Hi, Hasna. Yeah, if, if I may just call, say a word. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to thank very much Professor Pitalini uh, for this very nice talk and taking us through, uh, yeah, taking us uh, through this long journey from the basics of particle physics to the experimental high energy physics and the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear about the history of the wonderful ATLAS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, and especially if it's heard from one of the founding fathers of the ATLAS experiment, Peter Yeni. Thank you so much for taking us uh, through all these scientific challenges and technical challenges to build such great experiments, accelerators, and the different colliders at CERN, uh, starting from the underground aerial experiments to the Large Hadron Collider experiments. And thank you also for all the work you are still assisting to help building up a science future for all talented students from everywhere, as you mentioned in your slides. And uh, uh, just to mention, I was one of those who benefited from the opportunities and the programs you, are, you have initiated and still uh, assisting. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, Hasna. Uh, of course, let's see still the, the next step, namely now, now I talked about the experiment, but we will now come to the physics in one week from now. Sure, thank you so much. Yes, um, yeah, uh, Hasni, thank you very much for that intervention. Uh, I think uh, next week we will make sure that uh, people understand all the tremendous work and effort that uh, Peter has put in to develop um, particle physics groups uh, in Africa and all the assistance we are still getting from him to make sure that uh, those groups uh, grow and thrive. Um, so I suggest that uh, um, we stop for today and then we come back next week and we'll hear more about the Higgs boson and, and also hopefully Peter will also tell us a little bit about the African community in particle physics and how those uh, communities should uh, continue their involvement in the large-scale experiments uh, at CERN. Um, okay, so Peter, thanks again for uh, being with us for these uh, past two hours and this extensive talk is really appreciated. Okay, you are all welcome and see you next week. See you next week, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.